Sheriff's Office K9! If anybody's inside, speak out now, you will get bit! You didn't see anybody run through here at all? No running? Nobody running through here? Sheriff's Office, anybody in there, come out right now. And I'll send him that what you just saw was a manhunt for an active shooter who had just gunned down 28-year-old Joshua Niles. A neighbor witnessed the entire scene and promptly reported to the police that there was an individual wearing a black hoodie. While he was about to flee the scene, Josh's 24-year-old wife, Amber Washburn, pulled into the driveway with her four-year-old child. The person was shooting like this or like this. I couldn't tell which hand. Boom, 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 shot the girl in the car. The man shot Amber inside the car, but the kid was sitting in the back seat of the car and was left unharmed. As the calls about the gunfire came, the deputy who was around the block hurried towards the scene. What he stumbled upon was a lifeless male lying beneath the truck. When he looked around, he also noticed another vehicle sitting idle across the street. Upon closer inspection, he found that the front seat had a lifeless woman and in the back, a child holding onto his McNuggets alive, paralyzed with fear. But who was this person? Why would they take away the lives of two innocent people with bright futures? And most importantly, why put that poor child through such a traumatic experience? Born in 1990, Josh Niles grew up in a big close-knit family, fostering a deep sense of love and commitment. As a dedicated family man, he showed his affection by actively contributing to the well-being of his loved ones. As a teen, Joshua formed a connection with his high school sweetheart, Charlene Charlie Albert. Their relationship led to the birth of two children, Gabby, born in 2008, when Charlie was 16 and Joshua was 18, and Bentley, born two years later. Despite their youth, the couple navigated the challenges of parenthood until their eventual separation in 2012. Charlene relocated to Texas with her parents, and a co-parenting custody arrangement was established with Josh getting the kids every summer, while during the school year, they lived with their mother. In 2012, a new chapter began as Josh met and fell in love with 18-year-old Amber Washburn. Each summer, the family came together as Gabby and Bentley visited, and Amber became an integral part of their lives. The couple's love story continued to blossom, culminating in the arrival of their son, Joshua Jr., in 2014. Josh worked as a landscaper, while Amber pursued a career in an overnight bakery. Together, they dreamed of creating a stable future, envisioning marriage, a successful business, and a happy family life. Despite the challenges of raising their four-year-old boy, Joshua Jr., who was on the autism spectrum, they were devoted parents. But Josh's past came back to haunt him, and he and Amber paid the ultimate price as a result. It all began on a fateful afternoon in Sodus, New York, on October 22, 2018, when the serene atmosphere outside the couple's home was violently disrupted by the ringing of gunfire. The clock had just passed 2 p.m. when the 911 dispatch was flooded with multiple reports of gunshots, igniting a swift response from law enforcement. Coincidentally, a Wayne County deputy was in the vicinity, serving an unrelated eviction notice. As the calls about the gunfire came in, the deputy, with an earshot, hurried towards the unfolding chaos. Immediately have people coming at me. What he stumbled upon was a lifeless male lying beneath a truck. When he looked around, he also noticed another vehicle sitting idle across the street. Upon closer inspection, he found that the front seat had a lifeless woman, and in the back, a child holding on to his McNuggets, alive but paralyzed with fear. Now the deputy on the scene swiftly prioritized the child's safety and entrusted the little one to the care of a concerned neighbor. Once the child was safe, he called for backup and began processing the scene. The officers who responded to the call immediately started to collect the different pieces of evidence at the crime scene. The evidence they found in the vehicle included Amber's wallet, which was on her lap, and contained her driver's license, which identified her as Amber Washburn. Deputies also identified the male victim beneath the truck in the driveway as Joshua Niles. Police confirmed that the couple lived in the residence where the shooting took place. Now, when inquiring about the kid, the neighbors identified the kid as Joshua and Amber's child, Josh Jr. But there was still a question looming. Where was the shooter now? There was obviously a gunman on the loose. 
As they responded only moments after the shootout, the police tried to identify and catch the shooter as they suspected him being within the community at the time. Authorities warned the residents around the community to remain in their houses until the area was secured. There were a lot of blind spots, and they set up a perimeter. The primary witness was Josh and Amber's neighbor, Tiffany Thayer, who lived next door and whose kitchen window overlooked Josh and Amber's driveway. She'd seen Josh talking to an unknown male and him leading towards the truck. The gentleman was standing at a picnic table, and Josh, for some reason, had pulled his truck up next to the picnic table, and he was just leaned up against the tail bed of his truck, just nonchalantly just sitting there talking. The neighbor said that the conversation between Josh and the person in a hoodie was quite casual at first, but it quickly turned into a terrifying scene as the stranger pointed his gun towards Josh and shot him. When Amber arrived home in her car, her driver's side window was lowered. When she saw what was happening, she put the car in reverse in an attempt to get away, but the shooter turned and shot her in the head. Now the shooter turned back to Josh once he made sure that Amber was dead. Josh was trying to crawl under the truck to save himself from getting shot again, but it was in vain. The shooter fired multiple shots at him. Now, making sense of who was behind these double homicides was a challenge. And when looking at the way Amber was killed, it had to be someone who had some experience with a handgun because that was a difficult shot. The detective's immediate thought was that it had many traces of an assassination. Detectives located more neighbors who caught a glimpse of the killer before he fled. And from the accounts of these neighbors, they were able to come up with a description of the culprit. They described a slender white male wearing a dark hoodie and jeans, and some neighbors were even able to describe that he had darker colored hair with a beard and wore glasses. The officers initially started the manhunt using canine trackers who attempted to sniff out the shooter. One of the neighbors was also able to provide the direction of the shooter's last known path of travel, which was to the rear of the house and over a fence. The canine tracker was alerted to a piece of black cloth which was found to be a ski mask or a balaclava. We got a black mask, approximately 30 yards. And this would turn into a key piece of evidence in identifying the shooter. Did it look to you freshly tossed or dropped? Um, Hadn't been tromped on in the mud or It was an Under Armour um, ski mask. So, I mean, that's not something that usually people just drop or discard. So, uh, I mean, they're $30, $40. Pretty pricey piece of hair. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not something that... I know if I dropped it, I would have went back for it. They continued to try and follow the trail through the neighborhood. Finally, the cops accepted the fact that the shooter had escaped the perimeter. While the police searched for the killer, homicide detectives tried to talk to Josh and Amber's son for a better understanding of what happened. The poor child had witnessed the murders of both his father and his mother, but he was unable to provide an answer at the time of investigation as he was on the autism spectrum and nonverbal. Back at the crime scene, the forensic eunuch processed the driveway where the shooting took place. They found that Joshua was ultimately shot ten times. All the casings were from the same firearm and were consistent with the witness statement of Tiffany Thayer. This also confirmed that there was only one shooter. All the detectives found were 9mm shell casings, which they hoped could be used to match the gun if a suspected gun was found. It was also clear that Amber was killed with the exact same gun. The shooting of Amber indicated that the killer was well experienced with a handgun as he shot her through the window, which was a very difficult shot. The police were also sure that this was not a random event and was definitely planned. While the bodies were being transferred to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy, the detectives contacted Josh's and Amber's families about the ill news. I didn't know, I, I had no idea at first. I couldn't even imagine who would want to do this to him. Now, during the initial communications with the families, the police wanted to know if the couple had people threatening them or with any grudges against them at all. Was there anyone who hated them? Josh's family stated that there was no way someone would have a grudge against Josh as he was a kind and loving person whom everyone adored. Maybe somebody did try to like rob him or Wrong time. Amber's parents said the same about her. When the police dug into Josh's past, one name came up frequently. Josh's ex-girlfriend, Charlene Childers. The family said that they had a very troubled relationship, even though they had two kids together. Josh and Charlene had split up in 2012 upon mutual agreement, and Charlene moved to Texas with her parents. 
There, Charlene married Chase Childers, who had helped raise Josh's kids. But this relationship also didn't last long. The couple got divorced after Charlene started an affair with the town police chief, Timothy Dean. Back when she was in Texas, she worked at the Animal Control Department, which worked closely with the police department. And so she met him there. It started as a friendship, which later grew into a romantic relationship. They got married in March 2018. On her social media accounts, she posted a lot of pictures of her new family along with Tim. But Charlene and her husband had run into legal problems by the latter half of 2018, and the fallout had affected Josh and Charlene's older two children. Now, this is where things started to add up. The dots slowly started connecting, and there were some signs of hope for the detectives trying to solve the case. To understand the motive behind the shootout, we must take a look into Josh and Charlene's past. Now, you see, the detectives found out that Josh was in the middle of an ongoing dispute regarding the custody of his two kids with Charlene Childers at the time of his death. Charlene's trip to New York to retrieve her children just a few weeks prior to the shooting raised suspicions about her potential involvement in the double homicide. But they came to a conclusion that Charlene couldn't have a role as the shooter as she was verified to have been at her workplace during the incident. When questioned about her relationship with Josh, Charlene admitted to past conflicts but denied harboring any sort of intense grudge towards him. She emphasized that despite their differences, she never wished harm upon him. The conversation then shifted to Charlene's current husband, Timothy Dean, or Tim. Detectives were surprised to learn that Charlene was no longer with Tim and divorce proceedings had been initiated. Charlene complained that the loss of custody of her kids was all due to Tim's influence, highlighting the strain in their relationship. Further probing revealed that Tim at the time was residing in Texas, prompting detectives to explore the dynamics of their marriage and the root causes of their disputes. Charlene elaborated on the issues that led to their estrangement, shedding light on a complex web of relationship challenges and legal battles. Digging a little deeper into Tim's situation, detectives discovered that Tim recently lost his job, and when they reached out to his former colleagues, they revealed some troubling details. They described Tim as having a little man syndrome, meaning he had an inflated sense of importance because of his position as chief of police. However, behind his back, people would often laugh at his behavior. He thought, and again, this is just my speculation, but he feels like, okay, I'm, I'm the chief of police of Sunray, so you're going to respect me because of who I am. And people didn't. People laughed at him. The reason for Tim's job loss stemmed from a disturbing incident captured in a video uploaded by Charlene on Facebook in May 2018. In the video, Tim was seen yelling at his three-year-old daughter, Madison, for not eating her food. Skylar. I don't want to hear any huffing and puffing. I want to hear, yes, sir. Now eat. In just a few days, consequences unfolded rapidly for Tim. He was arrested, lost custody of his daughter, and was compelled to resign as police chief. Charlene also lost custody of her children, and their marriage began to crumble. Eventually, her kids returned to live with her ex-boyfriend, their father Joshua, in New York, leaving Charlene and Tim to face the fallout of their actions. Now, when Tim's ex-wife, Christina Hill, was asked about him and their relationship, her response was a bit different. He wasn't always like that. He was in a very dark place. He was about to lose his house. He didn't have any money left. He was about to lose cars. He lost his kid. About to lose the love of his life. Following Tim's resignation, detectives learned that he found a job as a driver for a local vending company. However, it was revealed that Tim had been consistently missing shifts at his new job. Interestingly, one of the days he missed his shift coincided with the day of the shootout in SOTUS. Further investigation revealed that Tim was also involved in a car crash in Kansas just two days before the murder took place. What's intriguing is that the vehicle involved in the crash was a rental car. What happened? Well, try to turn around. Okay, I got your license and paperwork for this thing. 
And it's a game rental car. Mm-hmm. Got yeah. rental agreement? Yeah. You want to jump in here with me real quick? Okay, jump in the front passenger seat. Listening in on the conversation, it becomes evident that Tim was providing a made-up explanation to the police officer. He claimed that he was attempting to make a U-turn because he'd run out of gas and was searching for a gas station. This led him to drive off the shoulder of the roadway and into a culvert, resulting in damage to the vehicle. However, there's one major question. Why exactly was Tim in Kansas in the first place? Honestly, man, I was just driving. My whole life has kind of gone lately. More or less living out of my car. But you had money to get a rental? Yeah, I still work. We're just off this weekend. You didn't want to take your car? My car has started acting up on it. Oh. So you're just driving around Kansas from Texas, huh? Yeah. So where's your wife? She's at home. I thought you said you didn't have a home. Well, we have a pending divorce and ah. uh, all that fun stuff. Yeah, that's mine. Pending divorce, huh? Is that why you're out driving around instead of at home? Yes, sir. That bad, huh? Yeah, like I said, it's all gone. Tim can be heard speaking to the officer, expressing distress about his personal life, mentioning the possibility of a divorce and how everything seemed to be falling apart. However, a significant finding in the footage raised concerns. Tim mentioned that he possessed a sidearm and a shotgun. This left the detective feeling uneasy, and he sensed that something wasn't quite right. Upon further investigation at the rental agency, the officer discovered that Tim was carrying additional firearms, including an AR-15 and several handguns, along with ammunition and body armor. Thanks for coming in on your day off. You're welcome. Appreciate it. The tote, when I opened it up, it was magazines with ammo and a... Big magazines or little magazines? Big ones. A, uh, a AR-style, like, miniature uh, rifle. That's when I saw the shotgun under the tote, grabbed the shotgun, and I saw a, a sport vest. And, with pouches or something? Um, I don't remember if there was pouches, but it was all black. Did he come in the shop? Yeah. He, we, he got, we, got, we should have video of him in the shop. Do you? And he should have we got twice. right there. This discovery added another layer of complexity to the situation, raising questions about Tim's intentions and why he was armed with such an arsenal. Now, when asked where he was headed to, he gave an intriguing answer to that question. So where are you going to go? Well, I've got a family friend that I was going to th- gonna go see, but... 422. Where's that at? That's all the way up in New York. To validate their suspicions, investigators examined the rental agreements and detected an anomaly. The rental agreement indicated that the car was rented to an individual named Braun Bowler. Who's Bowler Brown? He's a buddy of mine. Yeah, that's going to cause you more problems than anything. I know. So he ran the car for you? Yeah, because I was stuck at work. I wasn't going to make it in time. I'm not looking forward to that phone call. Upon further inquiry, they discovered that Braun was closely associated with Tim. It was revealed that Braun and Tim were friends who had served together during Tim's tenure as the chief of police. Intrigued by this connection, investigators decided to interrogate Braun to gather more information about the circumstances surrounding the rental car and Tim's activities. Braun Bolar had worked as a Texas police officer for 11 years, most recently at the Sunray Police Department. As mentioned before, Tim and Braun were close friends, having served together during Tim's tenure as police chief. According to Braun's statement, Tim found himself unable to leave work to drive to New York, and he stepped in to help. With Tim's credit cards maxed out and him being two months behind, Braun agreed to pick up the rental car under his own name. His credit cards were maxed out, yeah. and he's two months behind. Yeah, he told me, hey, I need a vehicle for the weekend. Well, okay, not a problem. Now, during the interrogation, Braun was made to reflect on his years in law enforcement and his relationship with Tim. He said that initially, he didn't think twice about Tim's request for the rental car, assuming it was for local use. He said that it wasn't until he received a troubling call about Tim crashing the car in Kansas that he began to doubt Tim's intentions. Now, during the interview, Braun adamantly denied any knowledge of Tim's plans to take the car to New York. He expressed genuine sympathy for Tim's situation and trusted him enough not to question his motives. Did you question what he's doing up in Kansas? 
at first, no, because I, you know, I thought you just had to go up there for a free delay. You know? I was like, okay. You know, I took it at face value. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, hey, are you okay? That's the main thing. He goes, yeah, I'm good. But the car's pretty effed up, excuse me. And I was like, okay, you know, we got insurance, we'll get it fixed. Dean never mentioned that he was going to go on a road trip, that he was going to go to New York, that he was going to go anywhere. He was just going to use that car, a rental car, locally. Yes, sir. So if I were to ask you, are you lying about knowing that Dean was taking that rental car to New York, what would you say? You'd say no. Okay. That's the truth, right? Yes, sir. Okay. However, when asked to undergo a polygraph test, Braun's results were less than favorable, leading to further interrogation. In subsequent questioning, Braun revealed shocking information. He admitted to having overheard Tim discussing plans to harm someone and disclosed that Tim had rented the car under Braun's name to avoid suspicion. Braun has a decision to make, whether he wants to be a good witness or he wants to be charged in conspiracy to commit two murders. You definitely don't want that. So you're saying you overheard Dean say, what? Ever's going to die. Ever's going to die? Mm -hmm. And he's going up there to kill him. He said he's going to go up there to kill him? Yes, sir. So the plan was to play then, then yes, that you rent the car, not in his name, so he wouldn't get caught. Mm -hmm. I'll be down. You're a very important witness, bro. I'll walk you out here real quick. Braun's cooperation quickly turned the investigation in a new direction. Following the interview, Braun was allowed to return home, but law enforcement kept a close eye on him. Once an arrest warrant was secured, Braun was immediately taken into custody. Simultaneously in Dumas, Texas, law enforcement officers surrounded Tim Dean's home, aware of the potential danger posed by his extensive arsenal of firearms. Recognizing the need for a cautious approach, they opted for a low-key nighttime arrest operation. With precision and care, they deployed a flashbang into the residence to disorient Tim and create an opportunity for his safe apprehension. Swiftly and efficiently, law enforcement officers took him into custody, ensuring that he posed no further threat. Meanwhile, a DNA test was conducted, which showed that his DNA matched the DNA on the ski mask they'd found left behind at the crime scene. With Tim now in custody, the process of interrogation and uncovering the truth behind the tragic events in SOTIS could begin. With a bottle of water in hand, detectives sought to unravel the complexities surrounding his connection to Josh and Amber. Tim recounted his interactions with the couple, highlighting moments when he'd been present during their custody exchanges. Tim's interrogation at the police station was a serious affair. They questioned him intensely to figure out how well he knew Josh and Amber. Had you ever met him in person? I'd been there when he'd come to get the kids. How did she react to this in custody? Obviously not well. Like yeah. anybody else? Yeah. yeah. I mean, she's never not had the kids. She blame you? Probably. Tim didn't seem to have any personal grudge against Josh. The detectives then dropped the bombshell that they had the evidence showing Tim was in the vicinity of the crime scene around the time of the murders. They wanted to know why he'd been in New York. Do you think he'd get her kids help? He'd get her back? I know there's no getting her back. There hasn't been. I mean, in your mind, is that a possibility? You thought maybe this would help get her back in your depressed state and stuff? I mean, it's done. It's been done. There, there's no getting her back. I accepted that. That's why I've been a state of mind. Is it true you hated Josh? I never even met the man. Tim's story was a bit murky. Initially, he said he'd planned to talk to Charlene's uncle to try to fix things between them. I was originally going to go see her uncle. See if I could talk to him and get him to talk some sense into her and maybe get her to ride this thing out with me. But apparently, he ended up driving aimlessly, getting drunk and lost in his own troubles. The detectives pushed harder, trying to get Tim to face reality. They reminded him of the severity of the situation and the importance of owning up to his actions. Despite their urging, Tim stuck to his story, denying any involvement in the murders. As the interrogation wrapped up, the detectives realized they weren't getting anywhere. Tim's stubborn denial made it clear that extracting a confession wouldn't be easy. Say, I'm sorry Josh and Amber got killed. 
Not that I you did it. That. No, I want. No, you didn't. You're saying I'm it in part. You can't even. I'm not. You know because you can't. You, you realize you're talking about being in service and everything. I mean, that's no doubt. You're saying that, but you didn't do it. You know who's going to believe that? I didn't do what they took my chances. I guess. I've never been in the presence of a bigger coward. Despite the setback, they remain committed to uncovering the truth behind Josh and Amber's deaths. However, this wasn't the only person in Texas that the police wanted to talk to. The investigators decided to circle back to Charlene, the one person they hadn't thoroughly questioned yet. The police found Charlene at an ex-boyfriend's house and brought her in for questioning. Even though she wasn't the shooter and wasn't in New York at the time of the murders, they had reasons to suspect her involvement. During an earlier phone call with the police, Charlene claimed she learned of Josh's death through a Facebook post. But this was a lie, since there was no public post revealing the victim's identities. Another red flag was that Charlene had reportedly driven Braun, the man whose name the rental car was under, to the agency to rent the car just eight days after the murders. They asked her once again how she found out about the murders. Charlene stuck to her Facebook story claiming she learned the news through a call with Josh's mother. So I called his mom. And she's like, Charlene? Yes, what's going on? Josh is dead. I hit the floor. Really? What the hell is going on? Yeah. But as the interrogation continued, the facade of Charlene's made-up stories began to crack. The detectives went deeper, questioning Charlene about Tim's relationship with Josh and any potential reasons for him to harm Josh. Charlene revealed that Josh had been abusive towards her in the past, but emphasized that Tim never spoke ill of him, except for having a desire to fight him if necessary. Josh used to beat the hell out of me. Oh, really? That's fine. But, you know, you know, Tim had never really spoke too bad about him, you know? It was more of, you know, if I could ever get into a fight with him, I would fight him. The detectives then pressed Charlene about her involvement with Braun, the friends she'd driven to rent the car. Charlene was evasive, claiming she didn't ask Braun about his business and had assumed the trip was for work. However, when asked about the distance and the gas, Charlene's responses became less confident, which hinted at her growing discomfort. Noticing this, the detectives confronted Charlene directly, asking if she had any role in the murders or if she had influenced him to commit the crime. Charlene adamantly denied any involvement but her demeanor betrayed her. Under the pressure of interrogation, Charlene's resolve began to weaken. And as the questioning intensified, Charlene eventually confessed to her involvement in the murders. Charlene went on to reveal to the detectives after losing custody of her children in August, she had a conversation with Tim expressing her frustration with Josh. She recounted how she vented to Tim, saying, You know, I was proud. I wish you would just can die in a ditch somewhere because every time I turn around, he's always bad about it. Saying how I'm too poor, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm done. I'm too much poor. Me and Tim talked about it. You know, yeah. Okay. I wanted just everything to go back to how it was where I had my kids. During the school year, he had them for the summer and every other Christmas. I just wanted it to go back to normal. Tim apparently agreed with her sentiments and expressed his own frustrations. Her desperation for a return to normalcy, where she could have her kids during the school year and Josh would have them for the summer and holidays, led her to discuss drastic measures with Tim. However, she claimed she didn't know much about the specifics of the gun, except that it belonged to the Center Police Department. In the lead-up to the murders, Tim, Charlene, and Braun would hold meetings in Tim's garage where they formulated their plan to kill Josh. Charlene's role was to drop off Braun at the rental agency, who would then drive the rental car to Tim. Tim would then make the journey to New York to carry out the murder. The plan, as Charlene described it, was straightforward. Eliminate Josh. However, she insisted that Amber was never supposed to be part of the plan. When Tim crashed the rental car, Charlene drove to meet him at the Motel 6 and then dropped him off at the airport to get a new rental car, intending to resume their plan on November 5, 2018. This chilling revelation provided the detectives with a clearer picture of the premeditated nature of the crime and the extent of Charlene's involvement in orchestrating it. Now, another fact that made Charlene's disloyalty much more painful to the victim's loved ones 
was that Charlene had actually visited them during the funeral and pretended to be grieving. Whoever did it has now made it to where my kids grew up that And that's nothing a kid should ever have to do. It's not something that you ever want to find out. The most I have to say to y'all is justice needs to be served. My kids need that closure. Charlene and Tim face serious charges in connection with the murders of Josh and Amber on November 5, 2018. After announcing the charges against Dean and Childers, Wayne County Sheriff Barry Verrett suggested that the double homicide stem from a child custody battle, with Timothy ultimately pulling the trigger. Timothy faced one count of first-degree murder and two counts of second-degree murder. Although he was in Texas at the time, he was expected to be extradited to face the charges. Charlene was charged with conspiracy and other offenses and was held in the Wayne County Jail. Charlene pleaded guilty on June 27, 2019 to her charges and testified against Timothy as part of a deal with the prosecutor. She revealed that the plan included stealing a gun from the Sunray Police Department in Texas, where Timothy had served as police chief. Prosecutors alleged that Timothy then traveled back to New York State to commit the murders. When asked about Joshua's death and the custody battle, Childers admitted, I got what I wanted. A jury found Timothy Dean guilty of two counts of murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole in August 2019. The judge told Timothy he'd spend the rest of his life behind bars, remarking on his lack of emotion or remorse throughout the proceedings, labeling him as a classic psychopath. Dean, you are certainly a classic psychopath. You've never shown one bit of emotion in this courtroom, not once of guilt or remorse. I really wonder what goes on in your head. If you have any sense of a conscience, you have to be haunted by what you've done. In court, Braun Bowler, the former police officer who helped Dean rent a car for the crime, faced emotional statements from the victims' families. They expressed anguish over the loss of their loved ones and the devastating impact on their lives. You know, it's probably a time to stop them. You were a police officer. You were supposed to protect and serve. Braun pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit murder and served one year and four months in prison before his release. Meanwhile, Charlene Childers received a sentence of 28 years in prison for her role in the murders. The judge remarked that it was one of the most senseless and tragic cases he'd ever handled. It strikes me that... There's three sets of children here that are going to grow up without a mother and father. These children are going to be traumatized for the rest of their lives. The families of the victims were left to grapple with the profound loss caused by the senseless violence orchestrated by those they once trusted. The whole incident turned so many people's lives upside down. I need to hear their names. I need, I need them. I need reminders of them. And it was especially devastating for the kids. Gabby, the older of Josh and Charlene's two children, was really hurt and confused. How do you explain to a child why their own mother would do something like this and take their dad away? Josh's sister, Nicole, had to step in and take care of Josh's older kids after he passed away. She already had four kids of her own, and it was tough, so she asked for help through a GoFundMe page to raise some money, but they didn't get much. Josh's younger brother, Kenny, now lives in their family home with his girlfriend. They're taking care of Josh's two dogs and planting flowers in memory of him. They're trying to keep his spirit alive in their hearts. While nothing can bring Josh and Amber back, their families take solace in knowing that the people responsible for taking their loved ones' lives are paying the price in prison. But what do you think about this case? Do you think the sentences they received were just? Let us know your thoughts. We'd love to hear from you. If you want us to cover a case of your liking, please drop your suggestions in the comment section below. If you enjoyed our content, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more captivating true crime stories.